Trying to solve the problems of the developing world through engineering is an immensely popular thing. Huge endeavor on college campuses throughout the United States and beyond. There are student organizations, alternative spring breaks, even courses like my own. They offer students the opportunity to travel abroad and provide solutions to people in need. When you add to that the private sector, the um, professional organizations and church groups, even the volunteerism programs, what you end up with is a veritable plethora of people swooping into exotic locales with these wonderful intentions of saving the world with their great American ingenuity and maybe petting a tiger while they're there. OK, so that sounds a bit cynical, but cynicism is growing rampant as we travel abroad and find how very often we encounter systems that have failed. Millions of dollars, even more hours of labor, go to waste on projects that fail almost as quickly as the people providing them leave the country. So what's happening here? This is a question we're beginning to ask in earnest, and I believe I have an explanation for that. And here it is. We all view the world through a lens, and that lens is our own experience. Now, to explain this a little bit, I'd like to start out by taking a look at some of the lenses through which others have viewed me. When I was a young newspaper reporter, and there was a vacant desk next to me, it was assigned to a, a new guy, and I'm afraid I didn't make a very good impression on him. You see, we shared a computer terminal. It was one of these old-style boxy things. And that was assigned to him while I was given this newfangled contraption called a personal computer. OK, yeah, this was a while ago. <laughs> well, and I'll confess, I honestly didn't know how the thing worked and didn't like it. And so whenever I came up on deadline, I'd shove the new guy out of the way, pull rank, and steal his computer terminal. Uh, that got me a bit of a reputation as an assertive, OK, aggressive um, yach. <laughs> Fast forward a few years, and after my children were born, I abandoned journalism to become a stay-at-home mother. Among my fellow stay-at-home moms, comparisons started popping up pretty regularly to Martha Stewart. And OK, there was that one unfortunate incident one year when I actually did cross-stitch embroider Christmas cards for family and friends. A few years later, I returned to college here at the University of Illinois in the College of Engineering. And a lot of my fellow students really didn't know how to focus their lens on me. Here was this middle-aged woman coming into the classroom, sitting in the front row, occasionally with a toddler, um, maddeningly staying awake through every lecture. But I provided also a, a, a maternal respite for these students, particularly if they came in particularly hungover or maybe a little bit upset from a sudden breakup. All of these views of me informed the way people dealt with me and understood me. And that was the way they, they accepted me. And this is, this is not unusual. I'd have to say, though, that the most troubling view that was the lens that was focused on me occurred when I took my first job in an engineering firm. The lens through which my first engineering boss viewed me was that of a housewife dabbling in men's work. Somebody who had probably muddled her way through college, um, wore strange clothes, and had an uncanny ability to talk to people, um, and worst of all, took up the work that was supposed to be there for the real engineers. It was actually a kind of a scarring way to be viewed. But in retrospect, I'm grateful for that narrow-mindedness of this man, because it drove me to a new opportunity, traveling and volunteering internationally. My first trip was to this community. It's a rural indigenous community in Guatemala, a Mayan community, Ketchikal. And it was created by a church mission to provide refuge to refugees of mudslides in the effective uh, the coffee uh, plantation, the uh, 
Finca system, which was very exploitive of the indigenous Mayans. I went to this place with no real expectations of what it would be like, no experience in the developing world, and frankly, not a lot of travel experience to speak of whatsoever. But what I found there was something that surprised me well beyond what I would have expected. You see, all of my experience up until that point with the developing world consisted of commercials and documentaries. You know, the ones that showed children with sad eyes and bloated stomachs, um, you know, toothless older people sitting under palm trees or bamboo hut schoolhouses. These were the sum total of what I knew of the developing world. And they created in me an awareness that made me want to act, but gave me a little more. The reality that I found in this community was vastly different. Houses were built of scrap wood, dirt floors, sometimes six, eight, ten people to a, a room. Latrines consisted of holes dug in the ground, surrounded by tarps that were draped on limbs driven into the soil. Young children, five and six years old, had significant family responsibilities, caring for their infant siblings, fetching firewood and collecting it for the cook stoves, or spending their days carrying water in containers balanced on their heads as they made their way up steep slopes from the river below. These all surprised me, but what surprised me even more was the fact that these people that I met in the community were smart and clever and funny and occasionally rude, sometimes a little devious. Actually, in short, they were everything exactly the same as the people from my own community, with the difference that they had the misfortune of being born elsewhere in the world. When I returned to the United States and I went into the grocery store um, in Wisconsin, where we were living at the time, I found myself stuck in the cheese aisle, paralyzed by all the choices that confronted me. And this is Wisconsin, so you can imagine there were a lot of choices. <laughs> How wrong, I remember thinking as I stood there under the bright lights, that I have so many choices in front of me when so many people in the world consider themselves fortunate if they have anything, something to eat each day. I had developed a capacity for attestation, that is, the ability to attest or bear witness through my own experience to what the world is like beyond and filter that back through my own understanding. So how does attestation play out? Well, on any given day, it could consist of me thinking, oh, these poor people with their unimaginably difficult lives. These are people who have never walked on a carpeted floor or sat in a comfortable upholstered chair who have never had the pleasure of a hot bubble bath or a gourmet meal, who have never been able to indulge their children with things or experiences to make their lives happier. On other days, though, it played differently. And it sounded like this. Oh, what amazingly simple lives these people have. They are so lucky. We've got this wonderful community. No financial concerns, no career pressures. How I envied them not having to follow a schedule. Attestation played out, either good or bad, depending on my mood, but it reflected my own understanding of the world placed on top of the experiences that I saw. But on subsequent trips to the same community, I found myself changing my understanding of the world through conversations I had with the community's members. We talked of amazing things. We talked about the meaning of life. We talked about our hopes for our children. We talked about the impact that the work I was doing in their community had on them, both negative and positive. We talked about what this all meant. These conversations have stayed with me and they actually follow me to this day when I go on any kind of an international trip now. And what they've implanted in me is the realization that nothing is black and white. To everything we do internationally, there's a risk as well as a reward. And the greatest risk of all is imposing our own view of the world on those we serve. 
I had achieved assimilation. Now, I'm going to tell you, assimilation is not an easy thing to accomplish. And it's also not a permanent state. I actually go in and out of assim assimilation with every trip that I take, um, regularly distracted by my own lens of perception. I have to wipe that kind of clean again and again. It's also a very difficult place to be. And I'd like to return to that community once more to give you an example. So on one of my trips, we were installing a water system, a distribution system with pipes. And I was working with two Peace Corps volunteers along with the men of the village. The women of the village didn't participate because they're prevented by cultural norm from doing any manual labor. So I'm working with the woman Peace Corps volunteer, and we're gluing together PVC pipe, and we notice that her husband is working with one of the men of the village right next to us. And we started deciding to make this a little bit of a game, threw some taunts at each other, and before you knew it, we were in a race. So as we started getting a little more heated in our challenges and our, and our barbs, we noticed the women of the village were gathering and watching us. And when the whole thing was over, the women had won, being the yacht that I am. I raised my arms, <laughs> and in really, really bad Spanish, I said, las mujeres son más fuertes, which I was really hoping meant the women are stronger. <laughs> so the women of the village were very excited, and they cheered and clapped for us, and we all shook hands and went home, and it was a job well done. But the next day when we came into the village, we were approached by a woman who was bruised and battered. She said that her husband had beat her the night before. And she asked us to give her shelter and take her back to the United States with us. I realized instantly that this was the wife of the man that I had been competing against. Did I cause him to beat her? I can't answer that, but I can say that to this day I feel some guilt over bringing that very American battle of the sexist competition to a community that may not have been equipped to handle or process or accept it for the lightheartedness with which it was intended. But more importantly, what were we to do about her request? If we gave her shelter, her husband would be very angry. And his perception of the marital relationship between a man and a woman was vastly different than ours. We were at sea on this, and so we went to our partner NGO and asked them what to do. These were the words that they used in telling us how to act. They said, tell her to go home. The village has a way of dealing with this. This is what they said they'll take the husband to the center of the village and beat the crap out of him. It was a devastating situation. But we had to acknowledge that this was not our decision to make. If we had acted, if we had given this woman shelter, we would have taken from the community their own ability to address the situation. And if we did that, we would have lost the confidence of the village leaders. And if there was one thing we needed with this water system to succeed, it was their trust and their confidence. Now, I'm sure there are people here who are offended by our actions. And I can't disagree with you. I'm offended, too. But I was there as an engineer to bring a drinking water system to a community that could benefit their health, their lives, their economic status. Could I sacrifice all of that for the sake of this one woman to adhere to my own values and beliefs? The outrage that I felt when this happened was clearly governed by, by my own value system. It was a gray area not black and white.
but it points out the characteristic of assimilation that makes it so very different from awareness or attestation. And that characterization is this, relinquishment of control. At the root of everything that we're talking about today is just that, relinquishment of control. As an engineer, you know, beyond my dedication to engineering, technical skill, um, supporting the community, entrepreneurship, empowerment, any of the other characteristics and ingredients that go into international development, whether something succeeds or fails internationally, depends on the willingness of the people delivering it to relinquish control. It means giving up your own lens of understanding, relinquishing that control and accepting with humility the view from your recipient partner's lens. Now, I've been fortunate that many of the people that I talked about before have been willing to take an assimilative view with me. The, the, the moms who thought that I was kind of Martha Stewart-like, some of those people have become my lifelong friends. And I'm pleased to say that they embrace me for how very un-Martha Stewart-like I've become. My classmates at the University of Illinois were willing to accept me into their study groups despite my age difference and my gender difference, recognizing that maybe they could benefit as much from my knowledge as I could benefit from theirs. I've been fortunate in later um, jobs that employers actually sought me out for my unconventionality, no more seeing that as an indication of an inability to do the work than they saw motherhood as an indication of a lack of work ethic. Oh, and that, that new guy in the newsroom who sat next to me? Well, I've been particularly fortunate that he was willing to take a more assimilative view. Because you see, he's been my husband for the last 25 years and the father of my three children. And his willingness to see me in a different way is one very, very big reason why I'm able to do the things that I do now. Thank you.